Good morning and thank you and welcome to today's webinar. Our topic today is CPACE market updates. And before we get started, I'd like to just take a moment to go over a few housekeeping items. My name is Nicole Sticken. I'm the Vice President of Energy Services with the Greater Cleveland Partnership, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. We want to make sure today's presentation is valuable to you, so we ask that you submit all questions by clicking on the question button in the control panel and typing your question. We welcome questions throughout, so please do submit your questions during the presentation. Today's session is being recorded and will be distributed to all registrants. It'll also be posted to the GCP in gear website. There's many benefits to PACE financing and one of the biggest benefits is the ability to preserve capital and credit line for core business investments and leverage a property assessment as part of the capital stack. CPACE can provide 100% financing for eligible improvements. And since the financing does not reside on the business's balance sheet, it can be equity. It has a longer repayment term than loans available for the same purpose, and it provides a fixed interest rate for the life of the financing. The GCP team has been working with several area developers who are learning more about how to leverage PACE financing as part of their capital stack to make their projects pencil stronger. That being said, today I'm joined by Chris Jones and Chris Bondra of Bricker and Eckler, who are our speakers today for today's webinar. Thank you for joining us both, and I'll turn it over to Chris Jones to uh, get us started. Uh, actually, Thanks. I take that back. Yeah. <laughs> uh, one of the but, things that uh, often we'll find, um, and we will hear more about why uh, and how to prepare your project, is it often starts with an energy audit to help uh, justify the kilowatt hour savings of any energy efficiency improvements that you are proposing for your project. And with PACE financing, uh, this is one of the requirements as part of the underwriting package. And the Greater Cleveland Partnership has had an exclusive program with First Energy uh, for quite some time now. And at no cost to the business, a business can uh, receive a free energy audit equivalent to an energy or an ASHRAE level two to examine all of the energy systems in the building and provide those recommendations. Once we've completed that audit, we'll sit down with you and review the uh, recommendations and the priorities and help align that with any contractor quotes that you may need through our contractors network. Right now, there's not really many incentives on the table uh, for many projects. Uh, however, those are always subject to change. So we will align incentives accordingly. And then lastly, uh, we'll coordinate with any of our PACE lenders whom we work with to then begin the due diligence process uh, and helping you understand uh, what a indicative term sheet may look like for your project. So with that, I will now pass it over to Chris Jones uh, to get us started more about the uh, PACE process and how these energy audits will play a role in that. Chris? Very good. Thank you, uh, Nicole, and uh, welcome everybody for uh, an early morning uh, start. So uh, we'll just kind of jump into it. Uh, the first thing we want to make you aware of is that we do have a lot of uh, PACE resources on our uh, Bricker uh, website, as you can see from this uh, graphic. Uh, we have uh, certainly been, I think, uh, uh, the common denominator, as I like to call it, of uh, PACE in, the, in Ohio, and we've been very active on the uh, national front with some of the national trade uh, associations and kind of the, the marketing and, and education, but those are just some of the uh, resources. Uh, just to let you know, the Berker.com there, the backslash PACE, uh, we do have interactive uh, maps, so if you do uh, have a particular project in uh, uh, a certain you know uh, jurisdiction and kind of go to the county and then those uh, circles that you see on the map uh, d does drill down to the actual uh, jurisdiction because in Ohio as you may or may not be aware of the the PACE district uh, generically speaking it's uh, termed an energy special improvement district uh, each state calls it something a little different but in Ohio it does have to uh, be at, at the jurisdictional level, so villages, townships, and city. And so that interactive map does a really good job. And uh, then from there, if you have any questions, certainly uh, 
you'll uh, see uh, Chris Bondra and myself, uh, our information you can always reach out to. So a little bit about the uh, history of uh, PACE. Um, we have, um, trying to get to the next slide, I think a little bit of delay. But basically with regards to kind of a uh, history, uh, PACE got started with state legislation. Uh, Ohio was one of the first states that passed back in 2010. Uh, and the Toledo uh, program was the first in the state and also one of the very few in the country uh, at the time. And so as a fast forward, there are now 37 states that have enabled uh, PACE from a state uh, legislative uh, standpoint. And of those 37 states, there's roughly 20 states that have active uh, programs. Uh, we are, you know, very happy to uh, say that uh, Ohio is certainly a PACE uh, leader. We are uh, currently number two and have been number two here for the last handful of years, but uh, number two in the country behind California in overall uh, total PACE financings. And uh, I, I think as time goes on, I believe that we can catch uh, California because we certainly have uh, the number of uh, buildings, especially older buildings, uh, that uh, that needs PACE. So a quick uh, update here with regards to Ohio, the, the local uh, programs throughout the state continue to grow. Uh, we will talk about a couple that uh, is uh, were formed in Ashtabula County and those specific uh, projects uh, with Chris Bondra. Uh, also did want to give an update on uh, a residential pace. Uh, this presentation is uh, focused on commercial pace, but uh, again, we know that there has been some press about the residential single family uh, program. Uh, the short is this, is that the program was uh, getting ready to launch back in, in mid-March, and like a lot of things, COVID put uh, a, a pause on that program, and we believe that uh, it will become active in 2021 at some point. Uh, and, and I think COVID will have a big part of, you know, how, how it gets resolved, but uh, did want to provide an update uh, there if there are uh, jurisdictions. So basically what was happening uh, last fall and through the beginning of this year, the uh, existing energy special improvement districts that had commercial plans uh, were also authorizing residential single family plans. And we can continue to do that. So if you're aware of any of uh, those energy special improvement districts that have not passed residential PACE plans, that is something here kind of in the interim that we can continue to be doing. And, and so that particular jurisdiction could be ready when the program is ready to go out in the future. So here is uh, an update as far as activity in uh, Northeast Ohio. Uh, we, we have increased uh, from our last uh, webinar back in June, so we have increased the overall uh, funding amount. Uh, I thought we were, uh, I was uh, uh, ho hopeful that we would uh, get over the $50 million mark cumulatively in these particular counties, but uh, uh, we're, we're pretty close and we certainly will be there by the end of the year as the, uh, the projects are kind of in the, you know, approval pipeline uh, will uh, certainly make, uh, make that happen. Uh, the, the couple of notes that we do want to make is that we have added uh, two projects in uh, Ashtabula County, uh, one in Harpersfield uh, Township and uh, one in uh, the city of uh, uh, Connaught. And again, Chris uh, Bonter will uh, provide details on both of those uh, programs and projects. One note that I did want to make just for reference is that Franklin County uh, the PACE program there has uh, recently exceeded $100 million collectively. And so, uh, you know, I feel that with all of the counties that we have on the board here, uh, certainly would be, uh, in my humble opinion, multiple uh, times uh, more volume uh, potential than, uh, than Franklin County. But Franklin County has done a really good job with regards to uh, promoting PACE. And, um, and, and so, uh, you know, you know, congratulations uh, uh, to them because it certainly does help our overall Ohio numbers. But just wanted to kind of give uh, give reference uh, point there. All right, uh, I will turn it to uh, Chris Bondra. 
Great, thanks, Chris, and thanks everybody for joining us this morning. Um, I'm Chris Bondra, and I'm, a, I'm an attorney in uh, Brooker's Cleveland office. And these next two, um, Spire Institute and the Conneaut Human Resource Center, these are projects that uh, I did work on um, and got over the finish line. And so I just want to talk a little bit about them. Um, but first, these two projects um, require the creation of a new ESID. And, you know, as Chris Jones had mentioned just a little bit earlier, an integral component of PACE financing is that it is that the property where the PACE project is to take place must be within an energy special improvement district. And this ESID is a public body created under Ohio law and controlled by a uh, board of directors of a nonprofit corporation, which are appointed um, members of the community and members of uh, the, the owner of the, the project. And the, the ESID, um, many of the major metropolitan areas in Ohio are subject to a, a regional ESID that encompasses the surrounding municipal corporations and townships. For example, um, Northeast Ohio Advanced Energy District is really active in Cuyahoga County, and um, there are about 20 communities that are involved um, with that ESID. In these two projects, Harpersfield Township and Conneaut, we had to create new ESIDs. Um, and the territory of these ESIDs are limited to the specific parcels of land on which the PACE project is planned, but any parcels in that municipal corporation or township that creates or joins um, an ESID can be easily added to the ESID. Um, once a potential PACE project is identified uh, on, a, on a property, the PACE project components and costs are identified in a petition um, to the local community to impose special assessments on that property and a plan for the undertaking of those improvements. While the municipal corporation or township kind of follows their own legislative process, uh, the ESID board must also approve the project plan and the agreements for the project at a meeting of the ESID board of directors, which are, are held um, as frequently as, you know, once a month or, you know, as per the a project when a project comes um, in front of the ESID board. So, you know, creating an ESID is, uh, straightforward uh, statutory process is outlined in the Ohio Rice Code. And it basically, um, it's a single project in a municipal corporation or township is necessary for the creation of an ESID. And it only has to be one. You don't need, you know, five or six projects it's going on at once. It's just be a single project. Unlike a traditional special improvement district, the parcels located within an ESID do not have to be contigu contiguous, but participation in ESID is completely voluntary for a property owner. Um, generally, how, how things work is a, a property owner will determine that PACE financing is well suited for their property, and then will reach out to either the municipal corporation or the township to initiate the process of creating or joining the ESID. And then the municipal corporation or township, alternatively, you know, sometimes we see can create or expand an ESID by using property it owns um, as a way to encourage the use of PACE financing within their communities. So these next two uh, projects, as I mentioned, um, the first one, Spire Institute, Harpersfield Township in Ashtabula County. This required the creation of the Harpersfield Township, Ashtabula County Energy Special Improvement District. And this one just closed um, within the last month. And really, this project involves new, constru new construction, renovations, and improvements to the Spire Institute Sports Facility. Um, and what it did is it included um, a, a big portion uh, of PACE financing and the PACE improvements. And so really, those were the installation of 10 manufactured single-story dormitory buildings uh, that will incorporate high-efficiency high building envelope, interior LED lighting, high efficiency HVAC units, um, a build out of existing square footage for classroom space, insulated entry doors, LED lighting, um, energy upgrades to the existing three main buildings, with, which will include you know, energy management system, LED lighting, um, HVAC units and, and duct installation. And so one, one thing uh, to point out here is, uh, you can do new construction, you can do retrofits of the existing construction. Um, the, the code authorizes both. And, you know, we're gonna go to the next slide here, but I wanna point out that you'll see here, this project was almost $2 million in, in PACE financing, whereas the next project um, was right around 100,000. So Chris, if you go to the, 
the next one. This one, Conneaut Human Resources Center, uh, financing of 115,000. And all this one did was a, um, a roof replacement, 14 year term. So th this also was a NOPEC uh, project, which they got their financing through NOPEC. And um, NOPEC is a great resource and tool uh, to be able to, re to rely on um, for some of the financing for this. So really it shows you um, the differences here. Uh, you know, you can go big, you can go small. It's really about the energy, the energy savings and, and what those will mean for your specific property. Hey, uh, Chris Bondra, uh, Chris Jones kind of jumping in. Uh, could you uh, kind of explain with regards to uh, NOPEC? I know we get a lot of questions with regards to, uh, you know, sometimes I'll hear, oh, you know, we heard that you can't, you know, finance PACE under, you know, $300,000. But can you kind of explain uh, how NOPEC is a little unique uh, in, in being able to finance, you know, some of the, you know, uh, you know, the smaller type of projects like this one? Sure. And then that's a great question. And so, as Chris Jones mentioned, you know, a lot of these private lenders, um, you know, they may not want to finance anything below 300000 or 500000 But NOPEC has a unique program for NOPEC member communities that um, they provide the, the financing through a grant program. And, um, you know, they oftentimes have lower interest rates and they are able to finance smaller projects like here in the Conneaut Human Resources Center. It, it's really a NOPEC specific program. It's outside of, of private lending. It's um, through NOPEC and, and through the grants that they have available. Chris, does that answer? Um, hopefully that provides a little more insight into it, the, the NOPEC program. It, it it does. I think the only other thing that I would add is that uh, that for NOPEC uh, to be uh, an available lender is that uh, the property uh, owner does have to be a NOPEC customer. And so uh, I know that NOPEC uh, has uh, fairly significant coverage, uh, uh, especially in the northeast part of the state. But uh, but that is one the one detail is that the uh, property owner does have to be a NOPEC customer, and uh, that would be stated on their uh, utility bill. So, uh, but other than that, yes, uh, they, they've been a great uh, resource and I think will continue uh, to be a, a great resource as well. In addition to obviously all the other pace lenders, but I just wanted to kind of, you know, make that point since uh, we were showing a, you know, relatively smaller uh, project uh, for, for pace. And uh, again, we get, you know, a lot of questions like, oh, I didn't think we could, you know, a project could be funded with pace under, you know, two or $300,000. So, yeah. Great, thanks. Thanks for that uh, clarification. And so, you know, PACE legal issues here. You know, what does PACE stand for? You you, you hear us talk about ECIDS, PACE, um, but PACE does stand for something. So it's property assess clean energy, and and really it you know property meaning that that the financing mechanism improves real property and is secured with an interest in that real property um, assessed meaning that the financing mechanism is paid for with special assessments, kind of like um, line items on, on your property tax bill, as, as Chris Jones will go in a little bit. And clean energy, meaning energy efficiency and alternative energy improvements, um, those are the only items that are eligible for financing. So put all together, property assess, clean energy, uh, and, and that's PACE. So getting into the particulars as far as what can be financed uh, with PACE, uh, Ohio, and, and this is also another comment, just kind of high level, that each state, uh, when the, their PACE law is written, uh, does uh, allow for the definition of what can be financed. Uh, Ohio's is fairly general in the fact that it uh, essentially just says that there has to be an energy savings component to the uh, building improvement or alternative uh, energy such as, you know, solar and, and wind and, and, you know, geothermal and, and on. But, um, but, you know, when you get into the real particulars, 
uh, when we kind of first started, you know, pay several years ago, you know, one of the things that uh, really wasn't talked about uh, too much uh, were a couple actually, and that's uh, roofing and elevators. And so with regards to roofing, yeah, you just have to kind of be able to do two things. You, you ha would have to increase the insulation um, on the uh, uh, on the roof, and certainly there would be energy savings uh, there, and that's how the uh, Conneaut uh, Human Resources uh, Center was um, uh, qualified. But then also another one is uh, elevators, uh, elevators from a technology standpoint, uh, you know, much uh, more sophisticated in uh, uh, their use and also their controls. And so those are generally a couple that just kind of come to mind that I wanted to highlight um, uh, to you. But also in addition, with regards to the current situation that we have with regards to indoor air quality related to COVID and building owners having to deal with, uh, you know, bringing in, you know, fresh air or how they filter uh, and uh, the actual indoor air those type of improvements can be PACE eligible as long as they can show energy savings. So uh, I think kind of quickly the example would be if, uh, uh, you know, the current, you know, codes uh, are, are stating that there has to be a certain number, you know, air changes kind of per hour. If in that uh, improvement uh, that would have to be made, if the uh, you know contractor of record or you know through the energy audit uh, could show that there's energy savings um, that that would really kind of check the box so to speak for that improvement overall being uh, you know eligible uh, you know improvement you know I think the other thing with phase two is that what we have generally seen is that uh, multiple improvements. Uh, are, are kind of the norm with regards to PACE financing because again, when you're looking at, uh, you know, generally what happens is that someone might have a specific need such as, you know, a roof replacement or a heating and cooling replacement, but while they're kind of going through that uh, financing application, they, you know, really it behooves them to look at, okay, well, have I replaced all my lighting with LED lighting at this point or, you know, insulation addition and kind of on and on. And so most of the PACE projects do actually have multiple uh, improvements uh, for them. So uh, just wanted to kind of highlight uh, the, uh, you know, specific improvements uh, that are that are out there. And again, if there's any specific questions ever, certainly can uh, reach out to us. So we do, uh, did want to really kind of uh, frame this one uh, slide for everyone from the standpoint of, you know, how can PACE really be used? And, and so really it, it falls into kind of three categories. So, you know, one is the, you know, existing buildings for retrofits and upgrades, which we've shown a couple already, uh, new construction, uh, you know, or gut rehabs, you know, major redevelopment, you know, type of uh, uh, projects is another uh, aspect, and we'll kind of explain what that underwriting looks like in a second. And then the third is uh, what we term retroactive pace, and that is refinancing uh, eligible improvements that might have been installed a, a year or two ago, but the building owner maybe just found out about pace today, and so pace can uh, actually be used to refinance those improvements that were installed in the past. And Chris, or Chris Bahandra will uh, explain kind of the details surrounding how that uh, exactly works. But, uh, you know, but that is starting to become fairly popular uh, from uh, the standpoint of it essentially allows the property owner to kind of recoup uh, you know, some, uh, some, you know, working capital, uh, uh, based on reducing their, uh, their debt obligations that they would have out there. So we'll kind of uh, uh, go through, uh, Nicole mentioned some of these at the very uh, start, but, you know, people do ask, well, you know, why would you use, you know, PACE? And, and some of these are the, really the reasons. Uh, generally, there's no down payment uh, required. Uh, there is no personal or business guarantee required, and that all has to do with the PACE uh, repayment being a special assessment. So that is the security uh, really that the uh, capital providers uh, who lend uh, on PACE uh, need. So they don't need a traditional kind of personal or business uh, guarantee. 
I would say that the third uh, bullet and the fourth bullet here are probably the two main reasons that we see when we ask property owners, and, and that is preserving the traditional credit lines. And I, and I think that that's probably number one, certainly in today's uh, economic climate and kind of going forward, is that again, yeah, they're using the, the equity that's in their property uh, to uh, fund these capital improvements and then they can leave their traditional credit lines open for other uh, operating uh, needs. Uh, the next one is resolving split incentives. And so this goes to uh, office building uh, situations in particular that have triple net lease tenants who are paying the utility bill and it allows a uh, building owner, for an example, to, in, uh, to do a LED lighting retrofit and maybe building automation controls. Those are a couple of things we've seen time and again that have really high energy savings that ends up being a cash flow positive in almost every situation uh, when you factor in the, the pace repayment because, again, you can uh, go out long term uh, as long as the useful life of the actual uh, improvements. Uh, you know, we have off balance sheet because uh, kind of an asterisk uh, there, we should put an asterisk is that you would certainly have to, uh, you know, get an advisement from your uh, accountant. But, uh, you know, in a lot of cases, again, the pace, uh, you know, repayment is sitting on the property tax bill. Uh, it, it is, you know, flowing with the actual property itself, which it does transfer uh, with the property upon a sale uh, or transfer, which has, you know, happened a few times already. We wanted to show this slide because this is uh, really why PACE has become popular, extremely popular in the new construction uh, uh, sector. So over on kind of the left uh, hand side where we're showing all the blue boxes, that is kind of the rundown of what a typical capital stack looks like for uh, new construction. But then if you look in the middle uh, row there, as it would be where you typically have, uh, you know, mezzanine uh, and the cost of mezzanine type of financing basically being replaced with pace. Uh, at 7% and, and really rates we've seen over the last handful of months are even sub 7% on new construction. Uh, the, the bottom line weighted uh, cost of capital, uh, you know, just if you show this to a CFO, uh, you know, CFO is always going to go with the lowest cost of capital, always going to be an equal. And so that is why uh, PACE has really, um, uh, you know, been uh, you know, very popular again in this new construction uh, arena. It's for that. Again, uh, it does have to be, you know, earmarked. The pace dollars have to be earmarked for uh, energy efficiency related. And the way that that typically is measured is that as long as the building improvement is shown to be above code, uh, that would kind of check the box for the uh, energy savings uh, component. So this is just a uh, basic graph kind of showing uh, an existing building on the left uh, and then a new or rehab uh, building uh, on the right. And so in the, both of those scenarios, there certainly has to be 10% uh, uh, owner equity uh, in the, uh, you know, in the building. And then with regards to an existing building, we do have pace lenders that will go up to 30% of the appraised value. And so just for round numbers, if there's a million dollar appraised value uh, property, then a maximum PACE loan could be $300,000. Whereas that same uh, scenario in a, a new or rehab uh, facility that the appraisal would be off of the as completed or as stabilized value, that number for the maximum PACE loan uh, actually uh, drops to 20%. And, um, and so th those are at a high level kind of what the numbers look like or the ratios kind of look like. Uh, a couple of other uh, points to make here from an underwriting standpoint is that, you know, there are prepayment options uh, for, you know, pace like there is traditional loans. And then uh, also very uh, uh, critical uh, and essential is that uh, any mortgage uh, holders to the property do have to provide written consent for each of the PACE loans because the special assessment uh, in a case of a default or foreclosure does hold a, a priority lien above the mortgage itself. And so, uh, and, and so on every one of the PACE projects, we do have to uh, obtain the written consent of the mortgage uh, 
holder. Uh, Chris, quick just kind of quick. Regarding, yes. Hey Chris, uh, just quick question regarding the mortgage consent. Um, have you found that most um, senior lenders are open to PACE financing? Uh, have you had to do much education with those banks or um, other financial institutions? And can you kind of talk about that process? Because I'm sure, you know, this is still somewhat new to the financial institutions. Yes, I, I'll uh, take a first uh, stab at the answer and then uh, Chris Bondra can maybe uh, uh, provide his perspective as well. But I would say this is that, you know, when we first started with the first PACE transactions, you know, five, six, seven years ago, uh, yes, uh, most of the uh, mortgage lenders had not heard of PACE. And even if they had heard of PACE, they were really not familiar with, with what it, you know, really is. And so, uh, you know, so to, in today's environment, I would say the majority of the mortgage lenders certainly have heard about PACE, but in, you know, some of the larger, uh, you know, in the financial institutions where you have, you know, literally hundreds, if not more, you know, if not more kind of commercial loan officers, maybe they haven't been firsthand at a PACE transaction. So, Nicole, to your point, yes, there's, you know, definitely is still kind of ongoing, you know, education. Um, I, I think that the uh, lenders today, from my perspective, and we'll get Chris Bonder's perspective here, but, you know, from what I have seen is that, you know, most of the mortgage lenders really kind of like PACE because it does kind of spread out uh, the mortgage lenders uh, risk to a property, especially on the in the new construction sector. But we have also seen that, you know, since COVID has hit in the existing building uh, sector. Chris Bonder, what's... Uh, Bonder also just jumps in. Um, I guess kind of a question in between there is also uh, with respect to positioning of that lien. Is it before, after the uh, senior uh, mortgage holder? How does that work with case? Okay, you broke up a little bit there at the very beginning. Could you ask that one again? Oh, just the positioning of the pace assessment. Um, is it before the mortgage? Is it after? How is it treated uh, and how is it perceived in the eyes of the mortgage holder? Yeah. Chris Bonder, can you uh, take that one? Sure. Yeah. So um, as Chris Jones had mentioned, you know, it's really an education piece that the more and more commercial lenders are um, being aware of PACE and a lot of them are consenting. Um, you know, let's really at the, at the its very core. So, special assessments that are being issued on the property. Pace assessment is voluntary, so you know it's not like a normal street or road improvement that needs to be assessed, and then the public has a right um, to maybe object to that. So that the property owners request um, the special assessment instead of being um, imposed by the government over someone's objection. Um, that's just you know that request enables the property owner to kind of seek financing on its terms they prefer. Um, and in terms of mortgage consent, mortgage lender consent, you know, I'm not aware of any, none of the deals that I've been involved with have um, objected and, and have not signed the, the lender consent. And, you know, that's for, you know, a lot of different reasons, but in terms of where it's, stand, it's like a line item on the tax bill. Um, so if you go on the web on your local um, county's website, uh, you can look up the the auditor information. You can look up your property. The pay special assessment will show up um, on there on that item. So I I think I hope that answers the question. If it doesn't, let me know, um, and we'll be more than happy to to follow up um, afterwards. I, Chris Jones, do you have any additional thoughts? Yeah, the, the only thing is, is that, yeah, there there definitely has been some uh, uh, denials of uh, the mortgage lender uh, consent uh, request, but I would say it's definitely, uh, you know, in the minority uh, at this point. Uh, again, you know, once the uh, mortgage lenders, uh, you know, kind of understand it, uh, we, we frankly have had property owners who uh, absolutely wanted to use PACE and maybe their existing mortgage uh, 
uh, holder uh, did not want to consent, and they they actually went to another bank and refinanced their mortgage loan and went on, you know, kind of with with pace. And so, um, you know, Chris Bondra, as you said, I, you know, every every property has you know different kind of economics, uh, you know, to it, and, and you know, in some cases the a uh, mortgage holder certainly has, uh, you know, more insight on the uh, maybe history and financials of a particular property owner, and uh, for that reason, maybe you know, would decline uh, the mortgage lender uh, uh, consent. But uh, but definitely in the minority these days, for sure. Yeah, and and going off of that, um, you know, the the pace transaction can benefit a mortgage holder because the property receives needed improvements to make that property more usable marketable and potentially more valuable um so you know although in the type of this transaction the mortgage holder is not making you know the credit decision on the pace loan but many of the same factors are involved in you know mo in offering mortgage holder consent um that they'll look into you know they'll they'll look into the length of the repayment obligation how long the assessment runs for the size of financing relative to you know property value uh, you know, any uncured defaults and any negative equity financing, um, vulnerable lands. So, you know, these are all things that mortgage holders already look at when they're, you know, financing the, the property originally. And so, you know, really it's about making this property more valuable and, and efficient. So that's why a lot of times we've seen um, mortgage lender consent come through with, without an issue. But as Chris Jones mentioned, every um lender is a little bit different they look at you know different factors um you know he said that he's seen some that have not been signed i personally have not he's been doing this a little bit longer than me so um you know that's kind of where we're at yeah and and one last thing i would add is that i don't know if we pointed this out but uh with regards to the uh pace assessment uh, having a, a priority position over the mortgage, uh, the, one of the really kind of primary reasons that the mortgage uh, lenders do provide written consent is that if there was a uh, foreclosure scenario, the PACE loan balance does not accelerate and become full and due like a traditional mortgage loan would. And so for that reason, you know, if there, let's just say that there's a 20-year term on a loan and five years in, uh, you know, they would go into that kind of foreclosure scenario. Uh, only the uh, PACE assessments that are on that semi-annual tax bill, uh, just like the property taxes that are in arrears, that's the only thing that would have to be paid current. You're not paying future uh, assessment payments uh, for this. And so generally speaking, when the mortgage lenders, uh, you know, understand that fact, that's generally what gets them comfortable uh, with signing off on PACE in addition to what Chris Bonder just mentioned as far as, you know, these are, you know, adding value to the property or, you know, installing, uh, you know, energy savings, uh, capital improvements to improve the asset. And so even if the bank would, you know, get the property back in their hands with a PACE assessment, it's a much more marketable property to go back out and sell. Uh, even with the pace, you know, assessment uh, with a uh, future buyer having to pick that uh, assessment up. So, yeah. All right. Uh, so kind of moving along here. Uh, so just wanted to kind of point out that the, as Chris Bonger had stated, the special, the pace special assessment is simply a line item that is on that property tax bill. And I like to say that it doesn't co-mingle with other uh, incentives or financial uh, uh, tools. And so all of these tools, uh, you know, whether it be TIS or tax, historical tax credits, opportunity zones, all of that can be utilized uh, in addition to PACE. PACE really doesn't affect those uh, items. And again, it can be combined, as we'll show you with some, you know, case studies uh, below. Uh, I think we already mentioned that it is uh, a single property and doesn't really affect any other uh, properties. Uh, I think we talked about property types. Again, this is commercial properties. Uh, we, you know, one of the things that we do get a question is that can nonprofits use PACE? And the answer is yes, even though they don't pay the standard property tax, they can request a voluntary PACE special assessment. So for that reason, 
you know, private colleges, universities, uh, you know, actual, you know, local governments can can use it and have used it. Uh, maybe not ideal if they can, you know, go, you know, go out and bond, you know, uh, funds at a at a lower rate and have the uh, debt, uh, you know, capacity to, you know, to do that. But uh, but those are all the eligible uh, property uh, property types. And we do start, you know, we do see those start to expand as the uh, awareness of PACE, uh, you know, expands to uh, kind of the mainstream. Chris Vondra, I'll uh, give it back over to you to uh, explain uh, a little bit more detail with regards to the PACE uh, uh, refinancing or retroactive PACE as we term it. Sure. So how does, you know, this type of refinancing work? Well, refinancing is a really excellent tool in the concept of PACE financing because what it does is it creates liquidity for borrowers who may not have it. PACE borrowers use their assets as, as collateral and that asset is the property itself, or whatever the real property elements are that are being leaned under state law. So if you have all your money soaked up into your project and you have debt financing on the project, there is an opportunity to refinance some of that debt out with PACE financing and potentially enable the swap of economics in the building as a result of that refi. Um, really, the fundamental point in PACE refinancing or retroactive PACE is it's not traditional commercial real estate financing or refinancing of a, of a mortgage. What is going on with PACE refinancing is the refinancing of an asset that is eligible for PACE financing itself. So you have to really analyze what that asset is that was installed or improved. You have to analyze how it was paid for and then analyze whether you have an opportunity to refinance that very thing or, or item. So one might imagine kind of a brand new hotel building and that hotel building has high efficiency HVAC, but it was paid for when it was built maybe a year ago with a construction loan and sponsor equity. You know, those are the only, that's it. And well, that hotel has PACE eligible a assets. And, those assets can be refinanced with PACE. So what you may do is refinance a portion of the construction loan and convert it into PACE financing. And what that does is it will decrease the amount of construction loan dollars from that senior lender from the project and increase the amount of PACE dollars from zero to whatever you will be able to, to refi. Um, the equity will remain. So the opportunity to refi is, enables a little bit of a position for the sponsor who had these assets in the building already. Bottom line here is existing PACE eligible assets can be refinanced. Um, so in order to be refi refinanced, they have to be initially financed with some sort of debt where they could have originally been PACE financing, and now you are refinancing the, the PACE portion out. Um, really, the, the more complement scenario we see is that the original financing was debt finance, and then coming along six months or a year later or a strategy to more permanent financing of the building, um, the PACE financing is then used to refinance that debt. You know, really um, explaining it from just a slightly different perspective, more of a, a legal perspective, we are trying to find those special assessment costs, the things that are eligible for PACE financing. So we analyze, you know, hard costs and soft costs. You know, hard costs would be perhaps the mechanicals themselves or the material that encompasses, you know, the roofing material, the windows, the HVAC um, unit soft costs, uh, the financing of professionals, capitalized interest, et cetera. For any of those things to be eligible in the first instance, they have to be related to energy efficiency or alternative energy measures. So when you come around to refinance, refinance these things, you have to find those assessment costs within your project. The general rules here to follow um, is debt finance, hard and soft costs, you can refinance with PACE financing. But if you had cash funded those hard and soft co costs, you cannot. And the reason is that once somebody puts cash in and allocates that to that particular asset, the expenditure is over and the asset itself has been paid for. So if you paid for things with equity, you know, you paid for them and to revive that item later really does not work under um, Ohio law and most state special assessment laws. The reason is that the special assessment laws require um, an eligible asset that has a live expenditure associated with it. So if you have satisfied the expenditure by paying cash, the expenditure is no longer live. But if you have not paid cash and instead kind of debt finance that expenditure, you can revive it for PACE purposes um, when you do a refi. In other words, you know, you haven't really paid off the principal amount of that asset if you have originally financed it with debt. 
you're just swapping out the PACE financing um, for debt. So the final point here is that sometimes there are different programs that enable inducement procedures to allow property owners who might be in the process of financing or refinancing a project. And that inducement really enables the property owner to just go ahead and do what they need to do. Um, maybe even apply equity to pay for the asset, but the inducement acts as a governmental act to preserve the qualification of the asset as a PACE eligible asset. So there are different rules that apply to different programs, but the inducement um, might be a way forward if you are looking at a particular brand new project and you just aren't sure how you're going to finance it. If you want to preserve the right to use PACE financing, you may ask about an inducement for the project. These are just uh, some of the high points here of, of PACE refinancing. And as uh, Chris Jones mentioned earlier, I mean, we're more than happy to discuss um, these with you. We'll get a little more detail on particular projects or some of the other items um, and any questions that you may, you may have in terms of refinancing. But I hope really that um, you know, gives you a good overview and, and how it works with what we call retroactive PACE or, or PACE refinancing. Thanks, Chris. And uh, we, now we're going to get into uh, case studies. And uh, Chris, w once we get to the uh, Middleburg Heights uh, Residence Inn uh, refinance, I do want to, to have you kind of explain really then also the, the benefit of, you know, more of a, uh, you know, relatively newer type of project and, and uh, in how when they do refinance with PACE, where they can, how it's going to also increase their cash flow because the first PACE payment uh, might then be out a, a year or two. And so uh, when we get to that one, I'll have you explain a little bit more on that one. So yeah, just a few case studies that we'll walk through to give everybody kind of a flavor, uh, you know, typical kind of office building. Uh, this was actually a, a gut rehab uh, and uh, pretty substantial, you know, kind of energy savings there. This was a, a new construction, same company uh, that actually had, uh, uh, use PACE. Uh, once they learned that they could uh, use it for new construction, they uh, uh, used it uh, on a property, uh, you know, for the, for that. This uh, project here is uh, one of the probably the, the most complex, if not the most complex, with regards to the all of the layers of financing uh, that were involved. I, I believe it actually had every type of, you know, uh, governmental incentive and uh, you know tax credits and, and loans, but again, as we mentioned, you know PACE is just a, a layer uh, in an overall capital capital stack to get a project uh, done. And, uh, and and this one definitely is a, a case study. I think we could probably uh, uh, you know spend an hour talking about the uh, fine details of how this one actually all came together, just from a kind of a public finance uh, economic development uh, perspective. Uh, this is one also showing uh, the first use of uh, PACE with uh, uh, Opportunity Zones. And here's the uh, Middleburg Heights uh, PACE refinance. So Chris, yeah, if you could explain the, uh, uh, the kind of the cash flow benefits and extending that first payment of uh, PACE out a year or two. Yeah, sure. So um, Residence Inn by Marriott, this is Middleburg Heights, Ohio, part of the Northeast uh, Ohio Advanced Energy District. And um, this was really one of the most recent and, and bigger retroactive PACE um, projects. And so this was a complete renovation of an existing hotel. Um, and this hotel, the, the renovations was completed in, in 2019. And the initial disbursements during construction were funded by a combination of equity and senior mortgage debt. Um, and so what had happened was in, in 2020, that the, the PACE financing um, was used to pay down a portion of the outstanding senior mortgage principal. And that existing mortgage debt was construction financing that the property owner would want to convert more, to a more permanent financing um, on slightly better terms. And so there's really 4.3 million that were refinanced as part of uh, this hotel. And this hotel was kind of unique, unique because the special assessments were spread over two parcels. There was um, a hotel parcel and a retail component parcel. And, um, you know, so we had to, to divvy up the, the different um, 
and we'd allocate the different special assessments to, to each parcel and that's done by the amount of energy improvements that were done to each parcel um, and it, like I said they were assessed for a total of four million and you know the as I mentioned that the pace financing was was used to pay down a, a portion of that the outstanding senior mortgage principal which um, help them and, and create more uh, equity um, in the property and they were able to convert um, to a more permanent financing on, on better terms. All right, thanks, Chris. There was a, uh, another project in the Columbus market that also was a, a refinance. Another one, uh, fairly uh, large refinance, uh, 16, uh, 16 million all, all pace, all re, uh, refinanced. And again, uh, I think that uh, property was only a, a year or so uh, new. Uh, this uh, a little older uh, project, uh, relative terms, but did want to just highlight uh, the um, uh, the ability of PACE to finance solar uh, projects and uh, you know currently uh, the federal investment tax credit is uh, 26% and um, and that is going to tear down in the coming year to 22% you know still a relatively good deal but you know basically the rough numbers on on solar uh, is you know let's just say you have a half million dollar gross uh, project cost, PACE can fund the entire $500,000 over a 25 or a 30 year term. The property owner can take the uh, investment tax credit uh, advantages in, in year one. Uh, there's also accelerated depreciation, which accountants have told us that nets out to uh, roughly another 20% of that project cost. So there's some pretty significant uh, you know, cash flow uh, advantages to adding solar uh, to a um, uh, to a building, uh, be it uh, large or or small. I mean, we've uh, uh, funded. I'm trying to think quickly. Uh, uh, funded like small end pay uh, solar with pace down in like the two hundred to three hundred thousand dollar range, and we are actually working on. Uh, a current solar project for a large manufacturing facility that is actually a, a $15 million uh, solar uh, array. And, um, and and so that's that's one where we would love to see more uh, solar being uh, installed, but, uh, but PACE is definitely a vehicle that can uh, help make that happen. And uh, so that's going to wrap it up uh, for us. Certainly uh, welcome to take uh, questions. But again, our uh, website uh, information, uh, informational pages. And um, we'll end with uh, our, our contact information there. Again, uh, either Chris is uh, here will be able to uh, help and happy uh, to help uh, along with uh, Nicole and, and, and her team. And uh, I'll leave it on this uh, final final slide. Uh, quick question uh, for either of you to answer regarding um, opportunity zones. Is there any uh, nuances to be concerned about uh, or aware of, I guess, uh, if you're investing in an opportunity zone using ACE financing? Chris Bonger, do you have uh, insight on that one? I, I do not, but I'd be more than happy to look into it um, and, and get an answer back if that's okay. Yeah, that's yeah. absolutely fine. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and and I and, and I would just add Nicole. Yeah, Nicole, I would just add the ones that you know I'm you know familiar with, like the one that uh, we showed as the case study that was there in Toledo. I believe actually we've had a, a couple of other opportunity zone projects with Pace uh, in the state at this point, and and several around the country that I'm familiar with, but I, mm -hmm. I think that it's uh, really straightforward. Again, you know, PACE is kind of its own, uh, you know, unique and specific line item in the capital stack, and, um, and and that is really, you know, what it is. So it doesn't, you know, I always like to say it doesn't co-mingle uh, with the others as far as, you know, affecting it in a, a negative way uh, at all. 
Okay, great. Thank you. And then what about uh, if you know you use uh, PACE financing in a new construction project and three years down the road, you decide that you want to add solar. Uh, can you add an additional PACE assessment uh, to the existing one? How, how do those work uh, together? Yeah, good, good question. Um, so you definitely can add a additional PACE assessment. And, uh, and then in addition, we have also, in that same scenario question you asked, had a situation where they uh, basically refinance the original PACE amounts into the new PACE project that they were doing. So they ultimately just had one PACE assessment on the line item. Uh, I believe, and we haven't had that many, but uh, of the couple that I'm aware of, I believe it was a, a matter of they uh, basically in today's environment received a, a better uh, rate. Uh, and, and even though they were, uh, you know, again, adding something new today, they just decided to go ahead and pull what they had done, you know, a couple, three years ago into that overall uh, pace amount. Uh, so they would just have the one pace line item. But it, it can work uh, both, both ways, pretty flexible there. Excellent. Thank you. I don't believe that we have any other questions at this time. Uh, but as I wrap up, and thank you both for presenting today. If another question comes in, we can certainly respond to that. Uh, but for those that tuned in today, thank you. Um, you've heard today how to finance energy efficiency improvements for new construction, for retrofit, uh, and even for a retroactive project. Uh, so if you're considering a project, know that the Greater Cleveland Partnership Energy Team is here to help you with first providing you that energy audit, coordinating the right contractors, uh, and even the right case lender, because they're not all the same. Uh, we work with quite a few, as well as Bricker, and we've assisted hundreds of businesses with those audits and projects, and now the PACE financing uh, to ensure the greatest success of that project. So with that, I'd like to thank today's uh, speakers, Chris Bondra and Chris Jones. And thank you all for joining us. Uh, be well, be safe, and have a great weekend. And I think that concludes today's webinar. Thank you.